Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm extremely proud of the work we put into this budget. To, to In Lansing, let's talk representation. The State House, 110 seats. You see, Michigan is known as the auto state, and, and I think many of us in this room want to keep it that way. Ranjeev Puri in his second term. He's from Canton Township, western Wayne County. For me, I am the only representative of Asian American descent in the Michigan House. There's been a fluctuation of a couple here and there in years past, but in this current session right now, I'm the only one. Are you surprised that you're the only one, or do you think there should be more, or could there be more? I think, you know, our government should be representative of, uh, of the communities that make up our state. Now, the acronym AAPI is often misunderstood. It stands for Asian American and Pacific Islander. The term is used to describe a diaspora of people with roots in over 40 countries. The Asian American demographic now is the fastest growing demographic in the country and one of the fastest in Michigan. And so uh, I think it's important that our representation represents the people that make up the state. Well, there's been a kind of a shift with, politically speaking, very recently. What does that mean to the AAPI communities here in Michigan, if anything? Yeah, well, you know, that's what I, I, I like to tell people. So I think the needs of the AAPI community are no different than the broader needs of, 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 of Michigan. You know, I think the AAPI community wants safe communities, wants good schools, wants a bustling economy. Now, the AAPI community is a little bit unique where it's seen a rise um, in, in hate crimes over the last n number of years, uh, especially in the onset of COVID with some of the rhetoric being used. Um, and so, but, but there's a number of communities that, that have suffered with hate crimes and so again I think the needs of the AAPI community do really fit well with the needs of of Michiganders all over the state. How about Asian American history in our schools? There was some legislation introduced last term with Senator Stephanie Chang didn't seem like there was much of a chance for that, but what about now? Yeah, you know, there's there's been a shift. There's been a shift in uh, kind of the power dynamics in, in Michigan last November, putting uh, Democrats in power for the first time in 40 years of, uh, in, of having a trifecta of controlling the Senate, the House, and the governor's office. And so I was a part of the package last year in the House. I introduced the bill in the House. This year we are planning on in introducing that same legislation again. The legislation the, would be part of a multi-bill package which would make our curriculum just more culturally competent across the board. So deeper instruction for not only the Asian American communities but the, the, the Hispanic community, uh, the Middle Eastern and Chaldean community, African Americans and the indigenous population. Do you have any timeline on when that would be? It's hard. You know, it, it, it is, it's hard. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will happen uh, this calendar year and, and maybe this fall. One other thing that's big or has been big recently is the, the Chinese operation, the Goshen Battery Plant. Last month, the state appropriated $175 million for a new factory near Big Rapids. Its Chinese ownership had some seeing red. We don't want the CCP here by way of the Goshen plant as they have no regard for the value and dignity of human life. The Senate committee approved the funding by a narrow margin. What's your take on that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I've, that's not the first time I've gotten that question. It's an important topic. I'm very passionate about our economy, um, our automotive industry, and particularly electric vehicles. Now, with, with the Goshen conversation, I think um, anytime the state is investing resources uh, or joining a partnership, uh, I think those partnerships should be scrutinized. I think where we should be careful is oftentimes hateful political rhetoric can be mixed in for political gain. More from Representative Puri ahead, but now let's hear from a few on the front lines trying to activate change amongst the AAPI. A couple years ago, you had Black Lives Matter with the George Floyd that activated a lot of folks. You had the Asian hate, the rise of that, 2021. And it puts us in mind of, you know, the Vincent Chin case here in Detroit going back to 1982, where it did kind of create solidarity among some groups. And I just wonder, is that tailing off post-COVID? Where are we on that? I I think you know part of the solidarity movement that we uh, that we need is to, to make some institutional change and some systemic change, and so I don't think we can you know it's not sustainable if we go from event to event and wait for the next one before we we come out to the streets or come out to the rallies. I think we need to think kind of bigger picture. So how you know how can we change the institutions? How can we change the systems? so that it's it's more permanent, more long lasting. So I think one of the good things that's happened over the last you know X number of years is that we've had more Asian Americans in the state legislature right, to give us a voice. And so that's something that's there and you know we can use that as a as a wedge to leverage some greater change. The good thing is we have the Asian Americans that we have are I think are very competent. 
What I like about, for example, Stephanie Chang, she's seen not just as an ally in the Asian American community, but definitely, I would say the black community, definitely other immigrant communities. She's definitely an example of, of that solidarity because I think we've had Asian American folks say that voice concerns about why are we participating in BLM movements? Because that's not our community. But I've worked with black organizers that are supporting the Chaldean community, the Asian American community. That's not their community, but they're, they're fighting for our rights nonetheless, right? So we can achieve more together. Well, I mean, it's kind of like the question that, that someone posed to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, how many women belong on the, the Supreme Court? Like, what, what's the proportion? And she said eight. So it's just like, yes, it's great that we have um, these new legislators who are coming up. Um, but right now we're thinking about even in, in Warren, we have a historic you know, race this year where we've got a, a record number of Asian American candidates who are running for office in a city that has been known to be a part of an extremely segregated part of Metro Detroit. And so people are beginning to move forward. They're, they're, they're pushing these boundaries and these barriers. And I think that needs to continue. I'm not gonna put a cap on that. I think you know, we, we always are going to need people who can reflect our communities and also be responsive to our communities. Explain a little bit more what's going on in Warren right now. You have uh, some folks running for city council, right? Who are those folks and why are they running? I think we have Mai Zhang, who's running for city clerk. She's Hmong. I believe we have Bengali candidates Bengali, running. Bengali, yeah. We're trying to keep this as not politically charged as possible, but you know, there's a lot of politicians that have been in their offices for a long time and they get complacent and Warren might be one of those cities. At least that's what people feel like when it comes to say the mayor or the city clerk. You know, Warren, Warren is a city that I believe is at least 20% black and at least 12 to 15% Asian which is not what it was when I was growing up in Sterling Heights right across the border. As the demographics have changed, the question is, are the existing elected officials responsive to, that, to those changing demographics? But I suspect that there are a lot of folks that think that it may be beneficial if there are people that represent our interests a little bit better. Well, let's talk about this uh, teaching this history statewide. There's been legislation introduced uh, in the past session and now maybe something coming up again soon. Uh, what do you think about that? Is that something that's going to really happen? I think so. So I, I really do. I, I think from the legislation being passed, but I, th I think the more crucial aspect is how it's implemented. So how can we get it out into the hands of teachers? How does it show up in the classroom? So again, that's just a normal part of the conversation. And you know, I think one of the things that's, <laughs> that's really under told is uh, like the 65 Immigration Act. So that opened up immigration again, uh, literally changed the face of our country. And so uh, you know, if you want to understand why there are more people of color here, more Asian faces, more uh, you know, Hispanic faces, uh, we can literally go back to that. And so I think when people say things like, go back to where you came from or you know, what are you people doing here? Things like that. They, they just really ignorant of that history. I learned this in a workshop, the uh, we're here only because you were over there. And I think that's really true when you look at the history of U.S. and the Philippines or U.S. and Hawaii, uh, Vietnam, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, building the railroads. There's a part the U.S. government has played and U.S. You know, businessmen have played in bringing over Asians here to serve as a labor force, I think, in particular. Well, Asian American history is important to Asian Americans to understand their identity, but... But I really think it's, it's important for everybody else. So in part of history course, we study when the Irish came over here and how they experienced discrimination. And then the later wave when the Italians and other Southern European, Eastern Europeans came over here. And we talk about Ellis Island. So even though my parents didn't come through Ellis Island, the expectation is that we know of it and know of its role in U.S. history. I think that could be said of Asian parts of history as well. That it, again, it's part of the narrative. And then without that, you have really an incomplete story, which then I think leads to some of the anti-Asian hate and, and such. We spend our whole lives learning about other folks. I don't understand why it should be a problem for somebody to learn about us, right? We all need to learn about each other. How is the media treating AAPI folks, if at all, from what you're seeing these days? With all the anti-Asian hate attacks, I think the media has done a poor job of inflaming racial tensions. You know, anti-Asian hate is, a, is an American problem, right? And it's not another BIPOC community that's committing these 
attacks on us. It's it's American society. I mean, that's my interpretation of it. Like, I mean, to be to be clear, there's a lot of anti-blackness in in Asian communities. I've dealt with it because I'm Filipino, but because of my skin color, the way I look, I've 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 had Asian folks say a lot of hateful things to me growing up and and to the current day. I, I had family members say say things about why are black people attacking us when literally there was a white man in Atlanta that shot like what was it eight eight or nine people and they didn't they didn't say anything about white folks. I think the media has done a, a poor job, I would say. Hate crimes complicated, but expect some action in the legislature. You know, we've actually introduced some bills uh, two weeks ago, uh, which will help broaden the definition of hate crimes and, and providing prosecutors with some tools. Because as current laws stand right now, the original drafts that were done in 1988 are still kind of on the books of what constitutes a hate crime. Uh, and those laws were done after the Vincent Chin incident in 1982. You know, one of the things that makes Canton so great are the various communities. There's places of worship, different faiths all over the township here. You know, I'm, culturally, I'm, I'm part of the Sikh community. Uh, Sikh Gurdwars here have been vandalized uh, a number of times. And it was actually a, an incident that happened to my family's former place of worship in 2012 that, that led me to run for office. A, a white supremacist mass shooter came into that, that Sikh Gurdwara thinking it was a mosque, uh, opened fire. Uh, killed six people that day. That was the seminal moment I had when I knew I wanted to, to run for office and fight for a little bit more. And what would these, this new legislation do? Uh, increase prison terms, that sort of thing? It, it's, you know, it's very holistic in nature, yes. Uh, you know, the, the goal is not to send more people to jail. There's a, a restorative justice component. Those laws were just introduced, but we've taken some learnings from other states around this country where you've seen people who do some of this kind of light vandalism have to volunteer at the place that they desecrated to kind of better understand that community with the hopes of kind of providing some insight and education. And so that's why I think a lot of these things are connected, even kind of going back to those education bills. If we can start that education at a younger age to hopefully kind of move away from some of these hate crimes. Another package of bills that was introduced about three weeks ago that will now declare um, a lot of Asian holidays as state holidays. Diwali, uh, Eid, Visakhi, Lunar New Year um, would all be now on the list of state holidays if those bills were to pass and, and signed into law. What more to do with Asian American and Pacific Islanders spread out across the region? For activists, the challenge remains. How to join them together, consolidate. With the Amer Asian American community coming together, forming a pan-Asian identity, getting stronger and more articulate and, and raising voices, I think that's great. But I think also the self-examination that we need to have as a community, our lack of communication across ethnic groups, it's very apparent when you're growing up in Michigan that here are the Novi Asians or the Farmington Hills Asians and here are the Madison Heights Asians. And so the fact that we cannot build power without each other these are things that are pulling us behind that we need to be fearless in addressing. At the same time that we are raising our voices and advocating for ourselves in terms of you know, racism coming from white supremacy. Um, but I'd be interested in those types of conversations. Watch One Detroit, Thursday at 7.30 p.m.